Welcome back at WNST, Towson Baltimore and Baltimore Positive. Shirt out front says so. Also, all of our programming brought to you by our friends at Liberty Pure. Uh, I tell you what, I've got, I got water on the set here. They, they actually do bottled water. They can bring you water. Anything that has to do with water, that's what they do. That's why their number is 800 clean water liberty pure solutions and certainly on the plumbing side on the well water side on the winterization side before your uh, your pipes freeze make sure you're giving our friends at liberty pure a call luke we're um we're in the festivus right i mean i i guess the goal met right i mean if, if you want to be playing in january they've checked off that box they didn't check off the buy box the buy box didn't work so well uh for them but as far as holding serve and watching everything else that happened in the league throughout the course of the year, the Ravens have a chance in this tournament, and they are the team that if you're watching the pundits all week long, they're going to say they're the team no one wants to see. Hey, they're a favorite on the road. How about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it speaks to the respect that really Vegas has had for them going back to last year. I mean, I'm not a big gambling guy, but if you look at – uh, the over-unders, you look at Super Bowl favorites. I mean, over the last two years, Las Vegas has been a, a big fan of the Baltimore Ravens. And why wouldn't they be, uh, considering they've, what, won uh, 14 games a year ago and 11 games this year? And uh, you look at how they've played since uh, the debacle with, with the COVID outbreak and what happened in Pittsburgh. I mean, they've played like one of the best teams in the league. So well, it had been an insane play last year when they're winning by 30 points every week, right? Like, they, they covered every spread for weeks and weeks and weeks, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, it certainly felt like it. Uh, and unlike the last five weeks where people could say, well, the only winning team you beat was Cleveland, they did it against Houston, who was, who was uh, you know, in the playoffs. They did it against the L.A. Rams on the road on a Monday night. Uh, they out did of it the in Coliseum. Seattle, right? Yeah, I mean, they, they, I mean, they did. They handed the Patriots their first loss in pretty emphatic fashion last year. So, you know, that's where I do take some pause. I, I've, I've already had a few people on Twitter. And, and look, I'll hear the argument saying that, you know, questioning whether the Ravens are playing better right now than they did last year. Said, let's not sell last year's team short. I mean, as, as much as it ended so dis in such disappointing fashion we forget how historically unique and special that team was that said this team's january legacy is an open book right now and that's where they have the advantage in the same way that you look at the 2012 ravens compared to 2011 2011 they were a better football team 2012 they had a better January, and that's what matters in the end. That's what you remember in the end. That's why we don't remember the 2006 Ravens as fondly as, as other well, teams. Well, Lamar's had two bad so, Januaries, right? And, and a third bad January well, the would Ravens, be a week from now, right now, we're not playing. No matter what happens, I mean, uh, you know, this will live for Lamar and for Harbaugh the way it lives for starting pitchers and managers, I guess, right? It does, but it's the Ravens have had bad January. And really – Two years ago against the Chargers, yeah, I mean, Lamar was especially poor in his first playoff start. Last year, let's not forget, there were, what, five, six drop passes uh, in the big Seth Roberts one. So, you know, that was a team effort uh, last him? year. But <laughs> to your point, the, the head coach and the quarterback, they're going to be tied together, and they're the ones that have the, quote, win-loss record as much as maybe it's, you know, I mean, the coach is one thing. It's um, silly to – Put, hang that on the quarterback solely because we know how much of a team game it is. But well, especially I mean, this week. This week, Lamar is 0-2, not the Ravens, right? Like, that's, that's the way the game's played uh, for fans and for media. Sure. Uh, I mean, that's fair or not. That's the way it's going to be portrayed. And, uh, I mean, we've talked about this going back to the end of the Joe Flacco era. The Ravens haven't won a playoff game since 2014. You know, it's been six years. So – it's time to, to get over the proverbial hump, so to speak. And that's not to say that anything short of winning the Super Bowl should be deemed a failure. But I think, uh, and we mentioned this in a previous conversation, I think uh, to a man, I don't think the Ravens even need to be told this or asked this, that they realize that if they go to Tennessee on Sunday afternoon and lose, because of how well they've played, because of how they've resurrected their season from uh, Thanksgiving on, it, the season would have to be viewed as a disappointment and as a failure in that context. I, I think you have to at least get to the second weekend and then we'll talk uh, about how they match up potentially with Kansas city. Uh, you know, the, you mentioned the Ravens kind of being that team that no one wants to play. I'd put the Buffalo bills right there as well, but they're the number two seed and, and you kind of look at them. Okay. If you're the number two seed, you're not really sneaking up on anyone. Although 
the Ravens, given that they are a road favorite on Sunday, probably aren't sneaking up on anyone uh, anymore either. So it's a matter of the matchups. And clearly this first round matchup is very enticing from a storyline standpoint. Uh, But as I've mentioned, this is a a Titans defense that is not playing at a level that it was last year uh, when they ran into each other. Uh, I would, I would also say that that Titans offense uh, is playing, you know, has had a better overall season this year uh, than it did a year ago. And uh, it's pretty special thinking about uh, a 3000 yard rushing team, which is one of the few to ever do that in NFL history, going up against a 2,000 yard rusher. Uh, I mean, it's for, for those who love the running game, for those who you know, try to push back on, on the narrative of the NFL being a passing league, and certainly it is, but uh, these two teams have shown that, yeah, you can still win with a uh, high powered rushing attack. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, how they match up. And uh, I'll say this, even though you certainly have respect for what the Ravens did on Sunday against Cincinnati uh, defensively, I still look at this game and think uh, there's going to be some points scored. Uh, it certainly feels that way. Uh, even if the Ravens are getting uh, Yannick and Gakwe and Jimmy Smith back in time for Sunday's game. I want to at least for a minute explore the game on Sunday because you know, you go out there and you feel like, well, I hope we're not biting our nails at four o'clock. I hope we're not one of those teams. I know I've talked for a month about somewhere along the line they were going to stub their toe and find themselves in a ball game that they didn't belong in. Uh, they didn't do that at all last year. This year, during that hiccup period where I'll still say Lamar wasn't right back in October, they found themselves certainly in Philadelphia and some other games and then the losing games where they, could, they couldn't find themselves for a month in November. But the way they handled their business on Sunday and, uh, you know, to, to break it down and say, well, they ran for 400 yards and it's legendary and it's uh, – okay, it's all of that, but they've gone out and proven that they look like a good football team again – by not making mistakes, by catching the ball mostly, right? By Lamar throwing the ball better, by Lamar finding seams and running for 60 yards on a drive and never being touched, running out of bounds, like literally. So a a lot of the concerns of two years ago and what we witnessed last year in this sort of buzzsaw, and then them sort of getting punched in the mouth in November in in a bad way and seeing them respond, I sort of like the makeup of what they're doing right now. I think they're going to win this week. I don't know if they're going to win in Kansas City or Buffalo, to your point. I think those are better football teams right now. But two weeks from now, wake me up. Maybe I'm wrong. I think the Ravens have the capability of being that, especially when you see the way they put it together. You see over the last month, a lot of guys, deeper depth, down the chart of played the Chris Boards, guys that are, that are playing and playing well. A- Averett, who mm-hmm. was a bit of a liability at various points, now feels like, all right, you know, he's, re- he's ready to go down to Tennessee and play football. I mean, and Jimmy Smith coming back, they, it feels like if, if I'm writing Purple Rain 3 right now, the story's got a chapter and a movement in it where they're getting some legs about them right now. And that's all you can ask for in January because I don't think they're the best team. I don't think they're constructed. I, don't, I, I think you're going to have a hard time going and beating that kid out in Kansas City. I think you'd have a hard time. The, 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 the Buffalo team looked pretty special in what they did on Sunday as well. But I do like the way the Ravens look. And if they're the third best team in the AFC, good. Go win a game this week and go prove yourself and go give Kansas City all they can handle next week. And if that's what you are this year, if that's where the water says you are, At least you had a chance to go out there and leave it on the field. Uh, I'd hate to see them take a facer to the Titans. I think it'd be devastating to the franchise if they go out there and lose 28 to 13 this week because they kick the ball around and can't get out of their own way. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. Uh, And uh, again, the fact that we're even talking about a playoff uh, run, uh, the fact that we're talking about them being in the playoffs, let alone pondering the possibility of a Super Bowl run, that speaks to how well they played over the last five weeks. Cause at, at Thanksgiving, we weren't talking about that. You know, we, you had kind of said uh, you didn't think they could win uh, with Ronnie Stanley going down. You thought that kind of ended their Super Bowl chances. Well, I don't think they, I think they're going to have a hard time winning a Super Bowl without Ronnie oh, sure, Stanley. Sure, sure. No, but, but no, my I'm point still, is. I'm still on that. Sure. And that's fair. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not even disagreeing with you. I mean, I'm, I'm, I only threw out the point that, you know, you don't have to truly be better than every other team. You have to be better than whichever team you're playing on that su- particular Sunday. I mean, the 2012 Ravens, 
they were better than the Broncos that year, but they were better than the Broncos on divisional, what, Saturday, I guess it was, uh, in, or in January 2013, and that's what matters. So last year, the Ravens were a much better t- team than the Tennessee Titans last year. They weren't on that Saturday, and you know what? They went home then. Uh, so, you know, we, we always get hung up on, on power rankings and, you know, which team has the better record, which team has the better statistics. And, look, all of that has value. Maybe the power rankings don't, but, you know, your win-loss record and uh, your efficiency metrics uh, that sites like Football Outsiders talk about, I think all those things have value. But, ultimately, it's still uh, a game that you play. Uh, not on paper, but on a field and human beings involved. And especially when you throw the COVID pandemic now into the mix this year, it's a, another layer to this that's not there normally. You know, it, it really is a case of, all right, sure, I'll, I'll give you Kansas City being better. I'll even give you Buffalo being better right now. But uh, if they cross paths with those teams in a, a couple weeks, they better tackle Lamar. Who knows what's <laughs> going to happen? And that's the thing. When you look at the Ravens, we've talked about this for the better part of over two years now. You can say what you want about Lamar Jackson's long-term viability and running too much and, and his health and what's he going to look like in five years or 10 years. But you got to beat him this Sunday. <laughs> that's the thing. They are such a headache to try to prepare for. We've talked about this for years with Kenny Amatololo and Navy and, and Paul Johnson with Navy years ago. They are so unique in what they do and what's interesting about this, and we've talked about this a little bit, I've written a little bit about this at BaltimorePositive.com, is the evolution of their running game. Their running game is not what it was last year. It's different. And last year, not to say they didn't run outside and didn't have that capability, but you had both Mark Ingram and Gus Edwards that you felt really good about running between the tackles. And when you have a Hall of Famer at right guard, why wouldn't you feel really good about running between the tackles? But as we saw through the first 10, 11 games of this season, it was a good running game, but it was no longer a special running game. Statistically, it didn't look that much different, but from an efficiency standpoint, from a success rate standpoint, it was, let's face it, kind of a far cry from what it was last year. But insert J.K. Dobbins into a more significant role. You scale back on Mark Ingram. No disrespect to him, but he's a running back in his early 30s. We kind of know how that goes uh, in the NFL. So you – I just want to see him break one just to know he's alive, right? Uh, (laughs) And look, I mean, he played some on Sunday. I mean, he he did okay. You know, he he had a 16-yard run at one point, and – they're one injury away from him needing to play a very meaningful role. But J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards have been such uh, an effective combination. And what has it been? It hasn't been the between the tackles stuff. If you look, so much of what they do is on the edges and counters and running outside. And uh, when the Ravens, at times, Greg Roman will use both running backs on the field and they'll motion J.K. Dobbins from the slot across the formation and he takes the handoff and runs off the opposite edge. I mean, you're seeing some, they got a lot stuff. of water bugs, man. And, and, and Gus, no question. Gus and, getting to the edge for a guy of his size. It's, I haven't seen much of that on the edge. I mean, that's sort of like Simpson Sayers kind of stuff for a guy of that size, right? He is just so consistent. And I think what's impressive about Gus Edwards that he doesn't get nearly enough credit for when you kind of look at what he did his first couple of years. I mean, Obviously, he came out of nowhere in in 2018. He kind of emerged at the same time Lamar did when they knew that they were going, you know, when they debuted this new offense with Joe Flacco hurt uh, and they started running the ball uh, 40 times a game or whatever they ended up averaging that season. Uh, He was the the bruiser between the tackles, and he did very well with that. And he averaged, I think it was 5.2, 5.3 yards per carry. Last year, we saw a little more uh, of an expansion of his skill set, but still very similar to that. This year, I mean, we saw him a few weeks ago catch a long pass down the seam. Uh, We saw last week the the check check down uh, to the outside where he makes a great catch and then he stiff arms a guy and uh, runs for 25 yards, whatever it was. I mean, we're seeing a guy that, you know, he's not Alvin Kamara. I don't don't want to, you know, portray it to be more than it is, but – his skill set has become much well, more well What's the old the military line? Be but, all that you can be, right? You know, you and know. when I look at what this team has done with a late round draft pick in Nick Boyle, who had, you know, who popped 30 tests early in his career to what they turned him into. I see Kyle Juszczyk running around, you know, a, a millionaire for what this offense and, and what that position did. And then they take Ricard, who's just big, right, and smart. 
and, and they turn him into a bowling ball. It, it, it's it really is, and the, the the vision for them to draft Dobbins and knowing that he could fill this crazy Ray Rice role, and more than that, these guys block too. They block. No question. They have to. And- <laughs> Right, and I, I'm glad you brought up Nick Boyle because to, to finish my point, I talked about the emphasis on more outside running uh, than we had seen earlier in the season. Keep in mind, this was a team that was anchored. I mean, Lamar Jackson is the centripetal force. He's the anchor of this offense. We know that. But if there was some, a second item that you would name, a second aspect to this offense that you would talk about last year, it was what? The three tight ends. Uh, the, the, those guys were so important. They ran so much 12 personnel, two tight ends on the field. When you trade, when when you trade Hayden Hurst in the off season and you lose Nick Boyle uh, in New England to the season ending injury, you're down to one tight end. And look, Eric Tomlinson has played uh, and he's done a pretty nice job, but he's not the, those other two guys that aren't on this team. That Don't forget your namesake. So, they brought your namesake in as well. Well, but he's gone now. <laughs> but what you've seen is a shift from a little less twelve personnel. And in fact, a, a lot less in, in many games, you know, not so much Sunday. They, they did run a lot of too tight uh, on Sunday, but, and they've gone more three wide. So they've become a little more wide open in how they appear, but they're still running the ball and it's a different kind of running. And I think what's interesting and look, I'm not going to sit here and pretend I'm Greg Roman uh, where I'm a X's and O's guru or expert uh, in that way. But it is interesting when you kind of think about this team, what have we said over and over and over about Lamar Jackson as a passer in this passing game as a whole? Where do they struggle more, relatively speaking, outside the numbers? So perhaps, and we'll see how this plays out over the next few weeks, we'll see how this plays out going into 2021, but perhaps part of the elixir for that is you put more pressure on linebackers and safeties on these edge runs, and you have them kind of looking there, does that potentially loosen things up over the middle? And that creates a few more seams, a, a, a few more windows for Mark Andrews, for Marquise Brown, if he's lining up in the slot, for Miles Boykin, who we've seen kind of become a touchdown machine here over the last five weeks. You know, it doesn't do much else, but when he does catch a pass, it goes for a touchdown. Uh, so, you know, you've, you've seen a, a little bit of a, a pivot in what they do strategically speaking. You know, the end result, it's another 3,000-yard rushing year. So it's not as though uh, they've changed their, their overall identity or their overall you know, objective of what they want to do offensively, but it does look different than it did a year ago. And I think that's where in the first half of the year you saw these defenses not shutting them down, but certainly having more success in containing them. And now we've seen that offense pivot, that running they, game They pivot. had a different desire, though, at that time. They, they, they were trying to not just show you pass. They were passing on first down in October, right? Like, literally. that They, they were. But, that, but, that, but, but even so, if you go back and look at the numbers, they were still running the ball between the tackles much more uh, than, and running outside less than what we're seeing now. And, uh, again, when you, when you lose Marshall Yonda, when – you have questions about Matt Skura, whether it's the knee, whether it's his shotgun snap ability. I mean, they had lots of movement between the tackles as far as who was well, starting there. Well, and also there. when so, you can't count to three and you jump off sides and you're in first and 20, sure. everything changes. Everything changes. And, well, and there was a little bit of that going on too. Yeah, there, and, and even on Sunday, I mean, they had an illegal formation. I mean, you know, I mean they, that, that's what was so impressive about Sunday to bring it back to the Bengals. I mean, you know, you saw a couple things here and there. I mean, what Fluker had the holding penalty on the opening drive that, that kind of sunk what was, what looked like was going to be a, a touchdown drive. They settled for a field goal, but I, I mean, you run for over 400 yards. Uh, I joked at one point that the Ravens, if, if they were concerned at all about not running up the score, they should probably start passing rather than running. Which, I saw that. Is, that was tweet of the day. It's just hilarious, right? I mean, it's I just, call it the tweet of the year, but the year's only a couple of days old, so I don't yeah, want to you know, you know, right. you know. My best, my best tweet since <laughs> last year. <laughs> so, but but it it was just it was just remarkable to see. And you know, you met, this brings us to J.K. Dobbins, and you mentioned him. Uh, and you know, it's interesting because I remember a couple of weeks ago we were kind of talking about his speed and, and comparing him to Ray Rice. I mean. It's a lazy comparison just because he wears number 27, but you watch him play, and how can you not be reminded of Ray Rice? But we saw the breakaway speed. I, I, I think he's got a, an extra gear that Ray Rice may not have had, and that's not a knock on Ray Rice as much as it's a compliment to J.K. Dobbins. I mean, this is a guy who – he's pretty special. And to, to 
fully clarify, and you know, we had this discussion after the draft. I never disliked the pick. I thought the pick was much more 2021 and beyond driven, and I still think that. I, I, I didn't think Mark Ingram would slow down maybe as quickly as he has this year, but that, that's the reality when you're talking about an early 30-something running back. So you know, hats off to Eric DaCosta and the front office for having that vision. And Well, seeing that is a Jake greater Dobbins. need than drafting another guard at that point or, you know, whatever, you know, wherever the real need may have been on the O-line or sure. uh, another wide receiver. We can always say that, right? That's a, that, that's a yeah, perpetual and- need. And that's not a, you know, I mean, that doesn't mean that that's a wrong or right proposition. I mean, it's, you know, which ice cream flavor are you choosing in, in that Well, DaCosta may say we got another weapon for the offense. Didn't matter where it is. Sure. You know, no we got question another, about it. another guy that this week the Tennessee Titans have to be very, very concerned about what happens when the ball's in his hands. No question about it. And, I mean, that's – I say this all the time, whether we're talking about – building a, a roster in baseball, whether we're talking about uh, an NFL offense, whether we're talking about basketball. I mean, there's it's more than one way to do things. And I, I think the Ravens have been a great, great case study of that the last couple of years. Now, has it shown up in January to this point? No. And, and again, that'll bring us back to uh, how much is riding on Sunday's game for this team to, to break through and get to that next step in, in terms of winning a playoff game and what that means for Lamar Jackson, what that means for Mark Andrews and Matthew Judon and basically the whole team at this point. I mean, there aren't many guys left from that, even that 2014 team that went into Pittsburgh and won and had a two touchdown lead in, in New England twice uh, and couldn't hold on. So, you know, so there's, you know, there's pressure and there's certainly more pressure than it's been the last few weeks. But when you are in a position where your backs are against the wall and you know that you have very, very little margin for error and, Regardless of it, whether it's Jacksonville, the Giants, or or the Cincinnati Bengals, you do look around and you see what happens in this league sometimes where uh, a Rams team loses at home to the Jets or uh, the Steelers go out to Cincinnati a couple weeks ago and lose. So uh, I thought it was, you know, as much as we whispered and discussed the possibility and not that anyone was predicting it, but how could you not think about what happened in week 17 three years ago with Andy Dalton to Tyler Boyd? Well, the Ravens made – they they dunked on that notion pretty emphatically early on in that game on Sunday that that was not going to happen. And you, you saw a dominant rushing effort. Lamar Jackson throws three touchdowns. And uh, I think what was really impressive, the defense forced turnovers and six three and outs. And the defense ended up playing 43 official snaps. 43. I mean, that's roughly what the Ravens had in the first half on Sunday. I mean, that's – uh, th- that's I saw you impressive. and Matt Judon and having think, a disagreement about that after the game. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he said 48. It wasn't 40. I mean, maybe if you're counting the, the, you know, the bl- plays that were completely blown dead, it, it was 43, even though the official game book had listed 40. So you know, I kind of went back and, and did the math. I, Nobody I was right watching that crap in the fourth quarter. <laughs> I know, right? right? Everyone, was, <laughs> everyone was paying attention to what was happening in Cleveland. It was 38 and, to 3, and my wife's like, come on, dude, put red zone on. And I'm like <laughs> – I might miss something. I might oh, miss the Mark Ingram 16-yard run. You, you, you know? wanted to I mean, see Tyler Huntley at quarterback. I mean, come on now. But, but it was just, uh, I mean, considering everything being on the line, the Ravens did exactly what you'd want them to do. And they did it very emphatically. And how does that translate to going up against the Tennessee Titans And by the Titans way, they did Sunday? it helpfully, we'll too. They didn't get more No hurt. question. Well, and that was the other thing I was bringing up about the defense only playing 43 true snaps or – or whatever it's ultimately listed at, as they didn't have Yannick Ngakwe. They didn't have Jimmy Smith. We know Calais Campbell's story really for the last month or so uh, that he's been playing and he hasn't been 100% and he didn't play against Jacksonville. Uh, So, you know, that Marcus Peters just came back. He had a pick on Sunday on just a terrible throw. I mean, one of the worst throws of the year from Brandon Allen. And don't even get me started on the Bengals. I mean, Zach Taylor isn't it, by the way. By the way, he, yeah, I mean, we, we'll do that in the next segment about the Eagles not trying and, you know, Schwartz's team quitting on the last night of his career and what, I, you know, I don't we'll, – we'll go through all of that. But to, to your point, boy, the Bengals, PU, right? I, I mean, and I, I don't know about Burrow. And obviously the other three teams are in the playoffs and the Browns and the Steelers are going to see each other. Sure. But, but the Bengals, they look far away. They look distant. I, 
I mean, and it's easy to say that when they lose the number one overall pick to a knee injury halfway through the year. And look, I saw some things I really liked from Joe Burrow, not necessarily in the first meeting with the Ravens because he was pretty overwhelmed by the pass rush and his offensive line had no answers. But even if you like Joe Burrow, even if you like T Higgins, who makes the big play on their first drive and then you know, gets called back by a penalty and he pops his hamstring, I kind of felt like it was over at that point because – He's had a nice season. I mean, he's a kid with over 900 receiving yards. He's, he's one of the few guys on the field that I thought, okay, if he breaks a long one like that and the Ravens you know, turn the ball over at some point, you, know, you, you, you kind of envision the, the sequence of events that lead to a close game. I felt like he was going to factor heavily into that. But after the, after the turnover on the batted pass, you punt the ball, you punt the ball from the Ravens' 44-yard line. And then at the, end of, at the end of the first half, you have timeouts in your pocket and you kick a field goal. Uh, I mean, what are you doing there? What, what's your objective? Are you trying to make the game look – are you trying to make the score look respectable or are you trying to give your team whatever chance they have, albeit really small, are you trying to maximize your team's chance to win the game? And Zach Taylor didn't do that. And, you know, that, that's where you kind of look at that and say, even if you like Joe Burrow, even if you like T. Higgins, even if you like some other young players on that team – I don't know. I'm not sure he's it. So we'll see how that plays out. And as you mentioned, it can't be easy if you're Cincinnati. Even if you love Joe Burrow, it can't be easy looking at the rest of the division and seeing the Steelers, the Ravens, and, and even, yes, the Browns back in the playoffs. And, uh, and you're sitting there with a head coach that you have to be wondering if he's the guy. But it appears uh, they're going to uh, continue with him, although it sounds like they're making changes to their uh, staff. Uh, at the very least. All right, Luke and I are going to be here all week going through all the sort of possibilities and the season and Festivus. And I will be visiting with a number of former Ravens alums as well as many, many folks down in Tennessee. We're going to have a full week here. So when you're wondering what Baltimore Positive is all about in 2021 during a Festivus week, Stick around. Make sure you know what's going on. But Baltimore Luke's the way to find Luke Jones. Luke at WNST.net as well. You want to find me, Nasty at WNST.net. Still finds me, Ness at BaltimorePositive.com finds me. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram and anywhere else that you happen to be. And we give uh, big thanks to all of our sponsors around here as we make our way into 2021. Our friends at Planet Fitness and our friends at Royal Farms be working some fried chicken at 1 o'clock on Sunday uh, as they're making it happen. Our friends at Pizza John's are open on Sunday, but never Monday. But they're playing on Sunday, but never on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Make sure you're checking them all out. We appreciate them and you and you being here. And I'm really sorry we don't have a, a bus and five airplanes headed to Nashville this weekend. But we are going to be covering some football. We are WNST.net, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore, and we never stop talking. Baltimore Ravens and Baltimore Positive.